Well, I'm sorry. Sorry for interrupting you, sir. Um, but we do have um, a caller on the line that has a question or a comment. Um, Brother Kofi is in the queue, so if we could take a couple minutes to address his question, um, that would be awesome. Brother Kofi? Shalom. Shalom. Thank you for allowing Shalom. me. Can you all hear me? Yep. Uh, Shalom. Uh, thank you for allowing me in, um, in today's radio show. It's been a, a great topic. Um, uh, my question is is to the um, the rabbi. Um, I forgot his name. It's it's hard to pronounce, but he keep mentioning to Rabbi Quete about um, it should be uh, they should uh, the uh, European Jews or whoever is in Israel they should have no about our people. Uh, by the way, I'm from the Eve tribe. Um, the Eve Enigma, the, the way we actually say in my language, I'm 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 Eve spoken language. We say Eve Enigma. Enigma is is a land. We were the um. Well, now when I got into the tour, I found out who I was. Then I um I, I called back home. I talked to my people, my mom, uh, my uncles, and stuff like that. Our people are really then lost. They they they're not lost. They know who they are. You know, we we've been practicing these uh these practices over time. For now, um. From how long the the uh, Rabbi Akwete was saying, and it's true, we are the same people. You know, we have our people in Ghana, Togo, and Nigeria, Benin, uh, all the Ive. And I did my research on is over five million of Ive around the world. You know, and more. And and the question you keep uh, you you keep asking the Rabbi about why they didn't record it. Why should they record? Who gives them authority about our people, our history? If it's anything, we got a question for y'all. What 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 are the curses those Jews that said they in, in the land of Jerusalem right now? What what are the curses they they went through? We can go to the scripture and pull out the curses of the the real Israelites. You know, we go to Deuteronomy chapter uh, twenty eight verse fifteen. The Most High saying these things gonna happen to y'all if y'all didn't listen to uh, to his voice. So the question is to that rabbi, what what are the curses the those Europeans that's supposed to be recording our history, what what are the courses they went through? Right, uh, I appreciate Kofi. you calling in. For, yeah, sorry No, about I'm that. sorry, yes, ma'am. I'm Rabbi Rosenberg. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I interrupted you. I'm sorry. Okay, no, no problem. I mean, I, there's a few things I'd just like to respond to him. Um, one is, I don't know how familiar you are with the European Jewish history, not even European Jewish history, just Jewish history in general for the last 2,000 years has been filled with uh, rape, pogroms, um, Jews couldn't own land. Jews were not were considered second-class citizens. Uh, Jews had very horrible lives living in the lands of the other nations. Um, it was just a m- much more recent phenomenon of you know wealth in the in the Jewish communities because they they really did suffer in Europe. But um, I didn't I don't believe that those curses are necessarily falling to the exclusive uh, whole house of Israel because I know there's certain prophecies that relate to in, to specific remnants of the people of Israel. For example. When uh, J- uh, when uh, Judah is blessed by Jacob, that he's going to hold on to the scepter of the law until Shiloh comes. And in, in the Genesis it says, and we know this is referring to he's going to hold on to the scepter of the law throughout the whole duration of the exile. So I would say that doesn't mean every single Israelite will. That means that this specific camp will. And secondly, is if if I'm not trying to disprove that all these things are happening in the region you're talking about. My stance is not to disprove it. My stance is to understand and learn about it. So if what you're saying is that you come from a clan of millions of people who have this identity, forget other people writing about you. Where can I learn about, uh, you know, on the Internet, some blogger, some poster, some human must be sharing this. Uh, I would love for the Hebrews to Negroes Network to, to follow up with you guys and get content and links to share where we can actually see, hey, there's not one scholar saying that everyone's doing it, but this is where we're starting to see um, and a, a pattern emerging, and that would be a fascinating thing. And then I promise you, from my from the bottom of my heart, that the Jewish people would get blown away. They'd be fascinated. They'd be thrilled. They'd be so happy to see that this is happening in these regions of the world. And this identity is happening. That would make everyone much, you know, very uh, optimistic about a good future if, we, if that would be the case. So I would uh, put the ball in your court to please, uh, cont- you know, continue what you're doing. I guess and educate of really what's going on and uh, post some links. And, and not from not from the one person speaking on behalf of everyone else. Just where can I see that the culture of the Bantu people is to circumcise in the eighth day? You know, forgetting if the European said it or not. Someone's saying it. 
Well, you know. Yes, Ra- well, Rabbi, wanna... you, you should have you should have asked that from the beginning because you were challenging what I was saying. I was telling you that no, this well, is my culture. Let me challenge oh, Let me finish, helping, please. You know? let, me, let, let me. I know, but when I was telling you, I'm telling you my culture, and you're asking me to prove it. You're challenging me that, no, it's not. Because if you go back and you listen, that's what you'll hear. I'm telling you these customs that no. we've kept that we still keep, regardless of any well, missionary influence. I'm giving you the details. I'm telling you we circumcise. You said the Eurobeds don't circumcise. They do circumcise. So these uh, facts, circumcise you on see, the what, what, specifically. Yes, um, yes specifically. Rabbi, you're, you're, what, what you don't you're, understand you're, you're, is when I, when I talk about the Eve, like my brother Kofi said, I'm talking about the whole group. I'm not talking about just the Igbos. The Igbos fall under the designation Eve. So the moment you single out the Igbo, the moment you acknowledge the Igbo, you should acknowledge all of it. We're not asking for acknowledgement, though. Exactly. But we're just telling you that if you look on the coast, this is who we are. I want to say this. I don't want to um, sound rude. Do we care if you accept it? Not at all. Because we don't have to prove it to you. We are telling you you take it or you leave it. Mm. But right. what so, we should do yeah, what, what, is go back to the Torah and look at the customs and see who is keeping the custom. Well, two, two things. One is um, when you go back and look at the Torah, where are you going to get that Torah from? You're going to get it from the, the only transmission that exists on planet Earth today that passed the Torah down from generation to generation. That's the first thing. Um, second thing is... And who did no that? Reason who, take... who passed... Rabbi, stop there. Who passed the Torah down from generation to generation? And can you prove sure, that well, to we me? we can start from the... Yes, we, we have every single name recorded for every single generation that has transpired since the time of Ezra and Nehemiah when they returned from Babylon to Jerusalem to Israel. We can list and name every single human from that time today who is responsible for being on a chain of passing on a Torah. Okay, wait, 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 thank wait, you very wait, much. Wait, that wait, 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 can I ask a question? Ron, Ron, with that question, 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 with that question. question. May, may I ask a question um, or make a statement? So if I'm understanding correctly, um, Rabbi Rosenberg, you're saying that your goal is to come together with other Israelites and, and learn about the history of other people that maybe you didn't know about before so that eventually we could unite as a people. And what Rabbi um, Ama, um, Basil was saying is that the European Jew or whatever needs to... to um, accept the fact or be open to the reality that our our culture started in Africa. And so instead of us coming to you, maybe y'all need to come to us. I, I might not be understanding this correctly, but I think the overall goal for both of you is that there needs to be unity among Israel. Am I correct or did I miss it? Well, the, well, the thing, yeah, is, yeah, the thing I, is, well, the thing is that Rabbi, like what Basil is trying to get a point, is get across is that we, there's, there's not a, the, the Jews, the, the European Jews are not the dictators of who's Israel, who's not. So we, the Israelites sisters in Africa, they don't have to, you know, prove who they are because they already know who they are. But when you have people in Israel that say that we can trace our, our lineage and the Torah is passed down from us from 2,600 years ago, even dating back to the times of King Solomon and King David, which is almost three thousand years ago. Uh, I mean, this is a, this is a huge feat to say that you've been passed down the Torah and passed down the knowledge of who you are according to your tribe for so many generations, whether it's through the maternal lineage or the or the paternal lineage. Um, because most of the times you guys say the, mater- the maternal lineage, which is not in the Bible at all. But what I want to say before I, I kick it to Basil is that you know when you talk about the the, the, feast, the feast days and, and we're keeping the, the the African Israelites are keeping the the feast days, but you know in Exodus thirty four twenty three it says that that, that you should celebrate the Feast of Weeks, the Feast of First Roots, and the wheat Harvest, and the Feast of Inga of, of, of the third of the year. And three times a year, all your meals should be able to appear before the Lord. But it says that the God of Israel will drive out the nations before you enlarge the borders, and no man shall cover the land when you go up three times a year to appear before the Lord of God. So if that's a, lo- a lifelong prophecy, then during the Passover massacre in 2002, when you had about 30 to 40 Israelis die, die and then maybe 140 got injured, 
against the Palestinians. Obviously, somebody was trying to cover the land that they, well, it's not their land, but the land that they was in before, covered the land when the Passover massacre happened. And in terms of enlarging the borders, the people in Israel today don't even possess the, 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 the territory of Asher, the territory of Gad, East Manasseh, and even parts of the tribe of Judah. So even though they're saying and, and trying to get the African, the people of Africa, the Baptist people, to admit that they're Israelites or show proof that they're Israelites, they don't even fit the curses of Israel or any of the prophecies that was given to us and told by us by the, by the Old Time prophets in the Old Testament. And so, and so the, the, the question really should be, you know, in terms of they are also proven, you know, that we have all these traditions and customs and and, and that are ancient, including Paleo Hebrew, which which I want Basil to to um, to you know touch on, is that the Ashkenazi and Sephardic Jews really don't have any grounds to say that they are of the ancient Hebrew community. Uh, this is actually coming from us that uh, all the Hebrew traditions and customs, you know, basically uh, stem from. We are the root, and then you guys are essentially the branches or the or the Gentiles that the world calls the Bible calls or proselytes. So it's really the other way around, and, and Basil can confirm that with the language in terms of Pedro Hebrew and the ancient customs. In addition to things that you guys don't keep in terms of the lashes, like in Guinea, they had tribes that, that did not go more than 40 lashes. And the people that was over there looking at them were like, why are they not going past 40 lashes? And they had names that mimicked the Old Testament names. And when they talked about uh, their ancestors, they talked about basically Old Testament people like it was their people, their ancestors. And so even when you look at the slave records, you see people named Kuya, Haigaya, Enya that were taken on slave ships from Ibibio, Calabar, Cross River area, you know, basically southeast Nigeria. Why are these slaves with the names Haigaya, Enya, Togaya, uh, Kuya with the names Yah in the end? Why, why are they having names in Yah in the end and having Hebrew traditions and customs and also ancient Paleo-Hebrew in their language? And, and Basil can confirm with that with the Ewe language. Right. Uh, okay. I appreciate your sentence. First of all, I just want to touch on what uh, Tina said before. Is 100% that the goal here is to to create a unity. And what what the rabbi I'm speaking with would take as a challenge. It's more of not not a challenge of trying to disprove them. More of like an honest intellectual curiosity. And you don't have to respond to me like why should we, you know, tell you know why should we do this? Why should you not be very open about the fact that there's millions and millions and millions of people all doing, uh, you know, certain cultures. I was under the impression before this call from speaking to Remy and other Igbo men that, yeah, they may be 99% genetically tied together, but their cultures are 99% different. That's what I was told. So so, somewhere over here, there's got to be a transparent uh, analysis or just a, a study of really what's going on. And not for the sake of you needing to prove it to anyone so you could convince someone that you're Jewish or not. There's nothing to do with it. This has to do with creating an opportunity for unity. If you have millions of people in Ghana who have a, a single identity, that's great. Then you can much, much easier to dissolve the British borders once you have those many millions of people. But I was under the impression that there's different clans who are not culturally similar to one another. And secondly, you mentioned all the prophecies that the, that the people in Israel today can't possibly fulfill the prophecies. But I, I can't even, I don't know offhand, I'm not that smart, how many prophecies there are today that speak about the future, maybe hundreds. And it's like kind of like a mathematical formula because some may seem to contradict others. Some happen in certain periods of time. Some are specific to certain parts of tribes and some other not. You know, like I could see a prophecy today that says, you know, I will gather you amongst those that have already been gathered to imply this is a one way of, uh, you know, so I could also say uh, it's very easy to start picking and choosing prophecies and who could apply, apply to which one. Secondly, I would also say when you say the Palestinians and the Passover massacre, I don't know if you know about this statistic, but they say 25% of the Palestinians in Israel actually have Jewish roots and were forced to convert to Islam over the times. And then statistically, uh, today in Israel, the terrorists are statistically coming from the villages that were once Jewish, which is a whole other question, a whole other radio show of why that's the case. Um, but, uh, you know, it's a, it's a phenomenon, and we say it's a psychological disorder from having a non-identity. But whatever, whatever it is, these are just like, you know, you make very big generalizations to try to disprove. So my whole, my whole thing, which may seem contrary to how I spoke to the rabbi today, if I was disrespectful, I apologize, is not to point fingers and say who isn't. It's to point fingers and say who is saying they are. There's a great evil in the world, and I know you know about this evil because I see your Instagram post, and, and you're on the money with a lot of the evil today. Um, but uh, the logical thing for me is when we're fighting evil, we got to draw a line of not DNA and, and not this and not that, but uh, a draw a line of ideology and righteousness. And then after we've banished the evil from the world, you could, if you're the priest of the, of the planet Earth, that's great. I'll accept it if the Creator comes in and like we believe He will and intervenes. That's awesome. 
But until then, we have to have a great unity. So when I'm asking the rabbi all these questions, it's not because I'm trying to disprove them. It's so I can go to a community, speak in front of a thousand Jews, and say, hey, did you guys know this is happening in Ghana? Uh, without sounding like, you know, that, I, that I'm actually pulling this information from real uh, content. And, and, you know, like when the, when the Pashtun in Afghanistan said they're from the tribes of Israel, the first thing they did was we started sending uh, <clears throat> surveys and, and pulling data and seeing, taking testimony from people in different villages. And now this is like the most coolest thing on planet Earth, that there's millions of people with this identity. So I think instead of when, the, when this whole thing emerges, which I hope it would with the Ghana uh, and, the, and these tribes out there, people aren't going to respond with criticism. They're going to respond by being blown away. But it's just, you know, I think to, to get this unity, if you are who you say you are and this evil is who, who, who we believe it is, so let's unite. But let's, let's just be transparent about who's, who's in, you know. Not uh, educators speaking on behalf of the millions, but the millions showing up to the table to unite. <laughs> well, well, Basil, this this one I'm gonna say I'm gonna leave it alone. The the thing is, if the Ashkenazi Sephardic Jews and the so-called white Arabs, the Palestinians, the Lebanese, the Iraqis, if they all had the same DNA, which was confirmed by Michael Hammer, geneticist, University of Arizona, and the DNA of the Ashkenazi Sephardic Jews. Maternal and paternal maternal is the same as European people walking around in Europe today that, that are Catholic, that are atheists. And the Arabs today that are in Palestine have the same DNA as the Central Asians or the, or the Ottoman so-called Turkmen, the Ugyars, the Avars, the Khazars, all sons of Tokamoth, son of Gomer, son of Japheth. Then that means that for Joseph and Flavius and how he talked about the Gomerites and the Magites and the Scythians and the Germanic tribes and all these different people, you guys are essentially... The, what the Bible calls Gog and Magog. And so the Palestinians and the Ashkenazi Sephardic Jews all are genetically the same. Y'all came from Central Asia, Turkmenistan, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, the Uyghurs, you basically came over to East, East uh, Asia Minor, East uh, Europe, which you want to recall it. You basically came down into the land, took over the land. The Ottoman Turks took over Israel, took over North Africa, took over Arabia and the Middle East. So you guys are basically telling, telling people, the world, that you are the real Arabs, the real Jews, and you essentially are the sons of Japheth. And the problem is, is that you guys are coming and saying, oh, the Ebo are the only people in, in Africa that are, that are the Jew or the real Jews. But genetically, all the Bantu people in Africa are the same person, the same people, and they all have the same traditions and customs that you can see scattered in different tribes, whether it's the Mandingo, the Seneca, the Yoruba, the Bibi or the Edo, Bini people, or the Ebo people. And so what they're trying to say is that you have – way more people that are Israelites in Africa, and you guys are statistically saying that 95 to 90% of worldwide Jewry is Ashkenazi, Sephardic, and Mizrahi Jew, and that's incorrect. Right. But so Basil, I mean, me, I want, I want me, Basil uh, to explain to you how the ancient traditions and customs, like, we don't, they didn't have the Mishnah and the Zohar and the Talmud. They don't have that. This is, that's something that was, that was produced in 300 AD times. But what about the Torah itself? Forget the Mishnah. Talk about the Torah. The Torah, okay, you want to talk about the Emo Yoquain people that live in Yoruba land. They possess an old Torah written in Aramaic, Moroccan, Arabic, and the old Yoruba language. They say they are the Jews that came from Iberia after the Spanish Inquisition. When they tested their DNA, the, the Emo Yoquain people means the strange people. You can ask any Igbo or any Yoruba person this. They will tell you that they came from Iberia to the place where their brothers were at, which is Cape Verde, West Africa, the Bada Bani. When they tested these people that have the Torah, that have the Torah and follow all the Hebrew traditions and customs different than maybe what you would see in a normal Yoruba person, they found that the DNA of those people were the same as the Yorubas, the same as the Akons, the, the, the Ewe, the God, the Yoruba, and the Ebos. And they had the Torah. Well, they had the Torah. Go, you can look yeah, it up. Yeah. Mr. Ron, I want to comment. Before we pass the ball to the uh, rabbi, can I just finish a quick, quick point before we pass the ball? It was fascinating that yes. you mentioned the Iberian Peninsula, that that's where the Torah came from, because actually we could trace uh, <clears throat> we could trace from the Iberian Peninsula. I can name almost every single Torah institution that was there since, uh, since the Israelites <laughs> first arrived there, since it's well-documented and recorded. So if, if a Torah made it from the Iberian Peninsula to somewhere in Africa, that would make sense, because we see very clearly that the Torah had a strong uh, foundation in the Iberian Peninsula. But secondly is you shouldn't have to waste any time on your show or in your, in your Instagram accounts trying to show that <clears throat> the ancient people of Israel were not white. The, the Jewish people today have a teaching that we say the ancient people of Israel were not white. That's not something we claim. 
Furthermore, mm. the Jewish people claim today to be a small remnant of a small remnant of a small remnant of the people of Israel. We don't claim to be the 100% exclusive descendants, and if any Jew does, he's a misinformed Jew. What we do claim, mm. however, is that this small remnant of the remnant of the small remnant has been in, in passing down the Torah from generation to generation. And part of that transmission may have had converts on it. We wouldn't rule that out. So, so when you say we share genetic DNA with the, the people around us, which must mean we must be them, I don't know, you know uh, who, who had converted 2,000 years ago and was responsible for being a part of the, the Torah transmission of passing down uh, generations. This is just my sentiments of just clarifying what I, what I hear from when you speak is not really what's happening on the ground from the Jewish people's perspective or in reality. So I think we should, you know, just keep aligning on that note. Okay, go ahead, baby. Okay, uh, Rabbi Rosenberg, you keep talking about the Torah. I want to ask you this question. If Moses should come back today, can he read the Torah that you have? <laughs> I personally... Um, yeah, I personally would believe so, and I have a theory why. Um, because Can you uh, share Torah that? In, in, yeah, in Jewish culture today, um, there's, there's groups in Israel who won't speak uh, Hebrew, uh, modern Hebrew, because they say it's a sacred language, and the Israelis have profaned it. They've made it um, uh, mundane by making it into a language when it's really supposed to just be used for a holy conversation and learning of the, of the Scripture. So they won't speak Hebrew. Um, uh, in when and when they developed Yiddish and when we have cursive, they wouldn't write in the in the in the Holy Scripture in Hebrew. They wouldn't consider writing in it as well because it's holy. It's only written that way in Torah. So when you're writing the language outside of a Torah itself, there's other ways to write each letter, and that's law almost amongst these uh, ancient communities. So I believe that uh, the sacred language or the Ashuri script today that we call it, which is not really found, like you're saying, you find Paleo Hebrew, not this was considered a sacred language. I don't know if you've done studies on it or not, but there's actually books and books and, and fascinating uh, scholarly works done for the last 2,000 years on the decoding the, the Hebrew letters that we have today, the deeper meanings and, and the secrets of them. There's a whole world of, of depth on them. So I, I believe that this is part of a, a, a sacred transmission for Moses. A lot of the laws we have today, for example, the Torah tells you on the, on the holiday of Sukkot to build the booth, you know, a Sukkah. But it doesn't say what a sukkah is, so it relies on us having all yeah. Hang on, hang on a second. Of what is, of what? Hang, hang on a second. You've gone off base. I just asked you about if Moses could read the Torah that we have. If so he could read it, why do you why do you term it? So why do you term it more than Hebrew, Brother Basil, why, Brother why, 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 Harry? Yeah. Um, so, Brother Harry, I, um, I'm going to give you an opportunity to answer that question, but I, did, I wanted um, you both to know that we had three callers in the line. We have Miss um, Helen, Mr. Hando, and Miss Shani. So, um, Brother um, Rabbi um, Harry, if you could answer that question really, really quickly, and then we'll, we'll get our callers on, and then we can continue the conversation. All right, yeah, my answer would be I think that Moses would be able to read it, and, and we have some laws today that we say that the reason we know that this is that Moses taught it from the mountain. It was transmitted from the word of Mo the mouth of Moses. So I think that there's a very, very direct connection today between a lot of the custom traditions of the Jewish people to actually what Moses was doing and what he was teaching. Thank you, sir. Um, so, can I... That did yes, not answer please, my question. Yeah, that please did not... I, I'm not asking you about customs. I'm asking you about a script. You call it yes, modern he Hebrew. Hebrew. Are you saying that the he wrote the modern Torah Hebrew based on the letters and the, and the words of the ancient mm -hmm. Hebrew? When the Israelis came uh, from Europe and resettled Israel, they made Hebrew a language which hadn't been spoken for two thousand years as a language almost, and it became you that know is they not used true. Now, uh, that that is not true. I disagree because Moses did not use the Masoretic uh, square script that you have. He used the Paleo Hebrew symbols. You cannot right. tell so us my, based, that Moses based can on my, read based on my theory, what the I, script. Based on my theory, what I just said is that they ha they, the, the language itself was sacred. It wasn't used to write. So there, there, was, there would have been, like I said, it would have been something like Paleo-Hebrew, which is a, a, a secondary language. It's all the Jews today have secondary letters and languages that they use to, 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 to speak and write. And, um, they don't write in the actual scriptures of the Torah itself because it's... it's it's uh, considered holy, and we don't want to profane it. Uh, especially if we write God's name in Hebrew, 
there's drop boxes in every Jewish community around the world where you have to put sacred documents to bury in the ground because we can't uh, damage them or profane them. So the way we treat uh, scriptures is very, very, very sacred. And I believe that's why um, Paleo-Hebrew was probably a, a much more common way to express Torah thought and idea. But this is a theory of mine, but, uh, you know, that's, that's where I... That's Good, where thank I, you. It's, you. A, it's, a, it's okay. a theory. I want to engage him. Okay. Sure. Just, uh, a, lot, a lot of the things we're discussing today, you know, are, are theories based on uh, people having great ideas and weaving truths together. But at the end of the day, we'll take the call. At the end of the day, this is about unity and not about division. It's not about me proving who is the right one or the wrong one. It's about saying, again, back to the main point, there's a super-duper serious evil in the world, and we're going to have to have a lot of humans all across the planet Earth aligned to, to, to fight it. And that's, that's really what it's going to come down to. So we have Miss Helen that has a, a really brief question or comment. And so for all of our, our callers, um, as you can see, we have a lot of information we have yet to discuss. So if you could keep your question or comment for like a minute or two, we would really, really appreciate it. So uh, Miss Helen, thank you for calling into the Hebrews and Negro Show. Yes. Um, uh, thank you for this opportunity. I have a simple question uh, to the rabbi, the Ashkenazi rabbi. And I have a brief comment. Uh, I hear him keep saying uh, Jewish. Something that he, in a dictionary, something ish, if, if I have to say brownish, is not really brown. So where did they get the name Jewish? And uh, uh, another okay. comment. When you read uh, uh, Psalms 83, it says uh, uh, nations will gather together uh, to eliminate the name uh, of Israel, you know? So, and you, when you look at all the curses that our people will go through, they won't be in the land of Israel today. So they will be scattered everywhere in the whole world. So how come every law is protecting the Jewish, I'm going to say Jewish, Jewish people, uh, that nobody can touch them. Any other person can, uh, can say anything and uh, be termed anti-Semitic, you know. But then they have a right to say over everything, you know. So I, I, I just want to make a comment. But I want to know where okay, they got great. the name uh, Jewish. Great. So, you know, just uh, it's a great question. Like you have Scottish and British. It doesn't mean they're like Scots or they're like Brits. That's actually just how they refer to them. Um, but the word for a, a, what I would have called, quote-unquote, a Jew 500 or 600 years ago would have been Yahud um, or Jude, Yehudi or Judai. That would have been the term used. Jew is a very modern word that was introduced maybe probably the last 100 or 200 years or so, Jewish. Um, and so that, that's really not such a, a relevant point in life because it's just a really new word, so it would make sense that it's not an ancient word. And so that question um, and Israel is not set up just for uh, a certain race of people. It's set up for people who are with the Torah. If someone adapts the Torah, becomes one with the Torah, he's eligible to move to Israel. Then you discuss, you know, how could it, people around the world are so quick to be labeled an anti-Semite. If they say anything, you know, how did you, you know, I'll tell you one thing the Jewish people have, which uh, quote-unquote the Jews have, um, that everyone can learn from, is an unbelievable force of unity meaning every single wealthy Jewish person alive today, Jew, concentrates their wealth together to protect themselves, meaning there are organizations and non-for-profits and, and all over the world today that are designed and established to protect the Jewish people. Um, and so they have people watching the news, organizations watching the news, and any time there's going to be something negative about us, we'll report about it. We'll say, hey, these people are doing propaganda. This ain't bullshit about it. We're on it. We're a unified force. We, uh, we act in in unison, and if any nation of numbering, you know, four, 10 to 14 million people would do the same thing, if they pooled together their million and billionaires to, to protect themselves, they would also have such a force, meaning you wouldn't be able to say anything negative about them without them making a storm about it, because you're, they have one voice. So this is uh, why you'll see today very quick to be labeled an anti-Semite if you speak against the Jews, just because we're so, we're so on top of the world as far as our protection of ourselves. Great, great answer, great response. Thank you, um, sis, for your question and your comment. So right now we have Sister Shani on the line with a really brief it's question not, or comment. It's not Shani, it's Shani. <laughs> oh, Shani, my bad. Sorry, sis. 
shalom to everybody on the panel. It's a great discussion tonight, and I'm so honored to be listening to what I'm, I'm hearing tonight because it is great. But um, my question is for Rabbi um, Harry Rosenberg. Shalom, Rabbi. Um, the question that I have, uh, well, I don't really have a question, but I just want to uh, make a comment on what you were saying because you were saying that um, uh, Jews did not own land, and you, and you was equating that to, the, to being included in the curses. But we all know that during the time of the Russian expansion into Europe was when your people were crossing the pale. You, you were coming out of the pale of settlements, and you was crossing over into the pale during the, time of the Roman, uh, during the time of the Russian expansion into Europe, at which time you guys were given the opportunity to come to America. Not only were you given the opportunity, but you were also too given 25 acres of land, and you were given money. And there are many Jews that are documented in the history of America owning plantations with slaves on them. And I point you to the documentary that your Jewish historians and scholars have called The History of the Jews. It's a documentary, it's part one and part two, where they really go into de detail about the time of the Russian expansion, about the time of the Russian expansion, and your people crossing the pale. Now, the second thing I want to say is this. Rabbi, I was watching a uh, video that you and um, Benjamin did. And at which time you admitted in the video that it was some of your um, your ancestors who found out that there were Africans, that there were Hebrews in Northwest Africa, and you sent letters to them. And this is before the 50th century. You said that right in the um, the video that you were doing with Brother Benjamin. So um, I think that kind of like explains that, you know, who... I don't mean to be rude, but I'm, I'm just going to ask you this question. Why is it that you guys are the only one to say who is Hebrew and who is not Hebrew? And my last thing is this. You, we all know that you guys do not accept Hebrews into Israel unless they accept your three things that you want them to do. And one of them is the washing and also to the acceptance of the Tammuz. And thank you so much for allowing me to speak. Right. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Oh, my bad. That was my uh, sister, Shawnee. I thought, uh, hey, Shawnee. Um, he said Shawnee, so, but I know who that's my sister. So, look, um, really quick, we had uh, a Brother Hando on the phone, and then after Brother Hando, um, if we have no more callers, we definitely want uh, Rabbi Beza to, to, to speak about Paleo Hebrew and, um, as part of our heritage. So, Brother Hando. Yes, uh, it's uh, bro Brother Hondo. Hondo, sorry, I'm really tuning people's names. My apologies. No, it's, no, it's okay. It's okay. Uh, salam to everyone. Um, I wanted to, I, I want to make a couple of quick comments. Number one, it's very disrespectful and it's out of order for a man who comes from one of the youngest groups of Jews in the world to denigrate through denying what, uh, I believe it was Brother Basil who was talking. I'm not sure. I just got on 20 minutes ago. But when someone tells you that, look, I come from this culture and this is what I do, this is what we've been doing for, you know, hundreds of thousands of years, and I know what it is because I'm closer to the action than you, my boots are on the ground. And for you to try to then go back door and say, well, this is not about division, it's about unity. The fact is he has a closer tie than you do to the action. Okay, it's like a private trying to tell a four-star general what war is like. It, it, it sounds ridiculous. It's very juvenile. Number two, I also am of the blood of the bloodline of Beta Israel. We're much older than European Jews, and I listened to what you said regarding uh, regarding the. You said something right, about you your people being Hondo. You said something about a, a, your your people being the remnant that kept Torah. We have too many groups on this earth that have older traditions than you and that are different than yours. They are different. We do not follow your customs. Whoa. And I have noticed, I, hold on, don't, inter don't interrupt me because you did it with other people. Right. Don't interrupt me. Okay? No, I, that wasn't what me, that was me. Okay, so that's the whole thing. wasn't me trying to interrupt you. I'm, I'm right, the engineer. So I'm trying to let you. We want to get you live. So, so what's your name? Hondo. Hondo. Okay, awesome. Great. Okay. All right. So when when you have when you have a group of people like the Ashkenazi Jews who come in and they are telling everyone else who is a Jew and who is not, don't get don't get around that point. That this is actually what's going on. 
When you go in and you tell you convert people in Zimbabwe, in Cameroon, in Uganda, and you go to West Africa, and you you only accept them when they take on your particular customs and traditions, that is a problem. You have no right, nor do you have the authority to go in and do that. They have their own customs. These brothers calling in are West Africans. I have a student. He is also descended from West Africans, and he is being trained further in our customs. They follow older customs in you. You have no right nor the authority to do that. Also, if you were descended, if you and people like you were descended from bloodline Jews, you would not have pale skin, okay, unless you just totally diluted, diluted your, uh, your bloodline. Okay, your skin is not, is not suited for that type of environment. That's just the, the fact of the matter. The ancient Israel was also ten times larger than present or modern-day Israel. So it consisted of, prime, at the vast majority, dark-skinned people. And this is a fact. And we still hold customs. My own people still hold to customs and books that are different than the ones that you hold dear. So we're not trying to hear anything Brother you have to say. It's very racist. It's very col- it's a colonial mindset, and it's enslavement. I've been seeing it. I've been hearing about it for my but, uh, I, but the Hondo, or um, I don't know, if, was there a question? Take over or, everyone or... else's customs and make them yours. Okay, so brother, um, brother Rabbi, do you want to, um, Rabbi uh, Harry, that do you want to comment? Or well, yeah, I mean, I was just, I would, I would, I would, I would for sure comment. She was saying that I was speaking about our transmission of the Torah, um, and I don't know if you maybe you weren't listening, or I'll say it again, but I did certainly mention that the, there was a, a transmission as well in Ethiopia. Um, so there's no question about that, that and we're not trying to deny that. And, uh, and in Israel today, I'm not necessarily coming here representing the government of the state of Israel and how they identify Jews around the world. I clearly am creating, a, you know, with my work and life, a platform where it's not about being Jewish or not, it's about being, having an identity. So the people in Afghanistan today um, who, who are they're Muslim right now, I'm not trying to get them to convert to Judaism. That's just not a political, you know, that's not what it's about. And finally, you didn't have to convince me that the people, and I, we spoke about this just 10 minutes ago, that the people of the ancient land of Israel were dark-skinned. The, the Jewish the people, the Torah that we preserve teaches that as well. So we're both on the same page. It's not something to prove us wrong. I mean, King Solomon had a thousand wives. Can you tell me the genetic makeup of each thousand of his wives? You can't tell me that one person may have come out of lighter skin and blended his way in? To make this about skin color is, is irrelevant. And just to end off, just to keep stressing that I apologize, People are taking it that I'm attacking what this rabbi is telling me about their culture and tradition. I was born in America on, uh, on the YouTube Wikipedia generation. So I'm like, hey, Achim, my brother, where can I just see this? Like, where is it? I'm not trying to say I don't believe it. I just want to learn about this. You're telling me, very, you're telling me about 5 million to more people doing something. Where can I just read about it? Where can I learn about it? I'm going to Google, and I'm not finding it. I'm having trouble finding it. Do me a favor, post the link, you know, something like that. So not from one person saying it, from, from you know, uh, where it's very clear that this is happening across the board. And I'm not saying that from a challenge that gives the proof to me. I'm saying it like, hey, maybe that's a great reason that we could unite because we're part of the same, uh, uh, you know, ancient family. So this is not, I'm not coming from a place of division that people may seem that I am. I'm coming from a place of inclusion. But uh, I'm also coming from a place of transparency. And when people make claims, they have to, you know, so there should be very easy Google, Googleable. We're in that generation. I apologize if I feel entitled to, to be able to Google things. Well, Basil, can you can you go ahead and, and you know you know basically go over what yes, you was just, um, you were saying? Correct. So um, I think because why you could not find it on Google because you did not type the correct thing. When when I told you what to type, Gadangbe, it came up. So it's no, not that we are hiding. Right now, but, uh, if, I, if you, could you did not contact me. You, according to you, right, you right, asked right. Remy. You should have contacted me, and I've given you all the sources if you really wanted to know. But you did not. Right, according now, to you, no, you talked to Remy. Out. Now we have a relationship, and now, you know, now we can move forward uh, in this dialogue. I, I don't think this is... Uh, just just um, making it clear that we have, to be, we have to be transparent. And and, sure. and and when we say something, we should know what we're saying and not um, um, step on anyone's toes. Okay, before we went to the question and answers, we're talking about the Hebrew script. And I, I'm hoping you're not saying that. When Moshe wrote the Torah and gave it to us, 
he wrote the Aleph in the form that we have it today in modern Hebrew. Did he write an Aleph or he wrote, he drew a picture of a head of a sheep? Mm-hmm. Is you asking me a question? Yes, sir. I the question is, uh, right. I can repeat the question. No, I understand the question. I'm letting you know okay. my personal opinion on the matter is that I believe that uh, the, the script we have today is much older than we think it is. Did he use, that when he wrote the Aleph, did he use two years and a Vav, or he drew a picture of a sheep? I personally would believe that he used two yuds and a and a and a and a vav, and that, that is, is what we have. That is with. not right. We all know that is false. I understand. We I understand we, that, that some of that we found archaeolo- you know, through archaeology may uh, may not align with what I'm believing, but based on the you know we have an understanding in the transmission. And I don't think this is a make or break point. This is just one of my versions of my it is traditions. A, I I personally. I personally believe the, that. The, 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 the text of the Torah tells us that there will be five cities in the land of Africa that still speak that language of Canaan. That is a prophecy. So if you, speak, if you say you speak Hebrew, and I'm asking you that, I'm telling you that if Moses is supposed to come back, he cannot read the Bible that we have because he did not use the script. He used the big pictograph, what we call oh, did, didn't he also translate the Bible into 40, uh, how many languages, 70 languages? That's another question. I'm focusing on the Hebrew script. Right. So I, I personally, I think for certain he would be able to read it. Whether well, the question is if, if that's what he originally wrote it in or not, so that's another question, but you can continue with your How lecture. can you read something you did not write? It? If I drew the head of a sheep, how does it translate to two youths and a vow? Right. Well, like, like see, I'm trying let, to say, let, we let, me, let me tell you the, why the, the letters we have today are the building blocks of reality. We call them the DNA of the world. That the is letters. not. The, that um, is not. The, I know. I know them offhand. That is. That is a tradition that you guys teach. Moshe did not correct. write to and you that, and that shouldn't get in the way. He wrote the head right of now, the sheep. That's our tradition. Mm. Okay. So I'm telling you that we have the ancient Paleo Hebrew script. We speak the ancient Paleo. If that's the case, it means that we are more ancient. It means that the Torah that you claim that you have, if Moses cannot read it, then we have a problem. Because I can go down the 22 alphabet and I don't, show I you don't, what they I, again, mean. I don't know why that's a problem. If, if Moses wrote the, the Torah in 70 languages, um, why, why do we have he a problem? He first wrote it in Hebrew. You don't speak those 70 languages. You speak Hebrew. And I'm, I'm telling you what I'm showing you, what I'm trying to do here for the audience is that the Paleo-Hebrew script that Moshe used to write the Torah is still used today in Evan Yigba. So my question is, okay, how do we have the ancient tongue? How do we have the Asian tongue and you don't have it? And yet you're telling no, so me I that you have, you a, trans- have a, a transmission. Well. How do you have it if it's not the head of a sheep? If it's not Bavo? If it's not Hihe? If it's no Yashi, I mean, I mean the script. The script that I'm talking about was is already in the time of the prophets and Ezra and Nehemiah, who were already Which writing script with the script that? that I'm. I mean, we're finding coins under the under the temple that are not uh, the head of a sheep. That they're actually you see uh, what their representation for an olive would have been uh, from first temple periods. You know, so at the time of Ezra and Nehemiah, I believe already, which which is still in the period of prophecy. I already believe that this was uh, the language that the letters that we have today was coming from for sure that time. Um, and so, uh, yeah. But that once, is not, once we're in the time you, of the question of avoiding is, that's not. So this is not, uh, for Moshe, me, this is not a context of the older community who is not the older community. No. All I'm trying to say that's is. That's not what know, I'm is, doing. Is I'm trying book. to use these customs mm-hmm. and traditions to show you that we say we are who we are because that's what you ask. We have customs and traditions, and I'm telling you, we have customs, traditions, and we preserve the ancient tongue. Mm-hmm. So now, okay, what you I should mean, do like, is so when, try. So yeah, now, sorry, what you, you do, continue. you should you, you should do if you really want to know about it, is ask me. Where can I find these things? How can I learn it? 
Yeah, because I'm, I'm definitely going to pick your brain, and I hope that uh, the Hebrews to the Hebrew to Negro show should pro- provide links also to show that this uh, these phenomena are stretching through different clans and cultures. Because I'm learning something new. Prior to this phone call, I thought. 99% of the culture of these different groups have nothing to do with each other. Now you're telling me the exact opposite. So I'm, I'm, I'm open-minded. I'm, I'm willing to learn and go in depth, you know. So I'll definitely reach out to you to send me information for sure. Awesome. Well, and then if I have one more question, if that's okay. okay. You, you said you could trace your lineage back to, um, you, you guys have kept a tradition. Back to is it David? Ezra. Did you did you say that Ezra? Uh, Are you tracing? Well, there's people today who trace back to King David certainly, but uh, our Torah transmission comes back from the time of Ezra and Nehemiah, who they were from a Torah transmission we know from the men of the Great Assembly and from the the judges of the First Temple. Okay, so you can trace the Torah, but not your family lineage. That's what I, I wanted to find out. Why I'm asking? Well, we is trace because... the humans. Uh, we know some of them were converts, some of them weren't converts. But we're it's not okay. a he- hidden secret. We're not trying to cover that up. We're very proud of the people who converted over time and played a role in becoming Torah sages and passing on the teachings. Okay, one last question for you: When Joshua was trying to find out who had taken something and Israel had lost the war that they went to, the Most High told him how to look for this person. He he describes the Hebrew family structure. If you read Joshua chapter 7, you see that. He was told that he should bring the people according to, they should come near by families, by households, by tribes, by man, man by man, that's what it says. So it says tribes, families, households, man by man. This is how the Hebrew family was structured. Do you guys keep this family structure? Um, yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, there's definitely people today who are from the Kohen, from the, who were traced back from a specific family clan of the, of the tribes of Levi. We have Levites today, um, and we have people whose last name are Benjamini, which means they're from Benjamin. Um, for, sure, for sure, I think there's an aspect to that, but I would ask you a question also. When you had these uh, family clans and the men, you know, so how would um, the multitude that came out with Egypt with them, they would be, I guess they would be part of the men. They wouldn't have a, a clan or a family they belonged to, but uh, certainly they were considered equals. Uh, they were part of the nation. Okay. Correct. But what I'm saying is, if you look at how, um, um, as, as example, when Moshe came to Egypt to tell the people that Yah says, I'm bringing you out, he told the elders, and then the elders told Three million people. The question is, how did they achieve that? It was through the family structure. When you look at Joshua 7, we see the Hebrew family structure. Tribes, families, households, and then man by man. If you come to Evanyiba, Hebrew land, I can tell you my tribe. I'm from the tribe of God. I can tell you my family. I'm from Amachewe. I can tell you the household I belong to. I belong to Ni Amakwa, Amar's family, and then I'm an individual of my own. So when you look at this structure that the Most High himself commanded Joshua how to find somebody is this structure, tribe, family, household, and then the individual. We have kept this. And I wanted to find so out this is actually, the same. So um, if I should ask you, if I should ask you your tribe, your family, family your household. They, 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 oh, sorry. No, so if I should ask you that, are you able to tell me your tribe, your family, your household? Uh, well, I can tell you the name. Uh, so when we get called up to the Torah, it says they call me up my name, the son of who? So I can tell you I am the son of the son of the son of the son of back 2,000 years. Some people could do that for sure. But in, I would say in Afghanistan today where they say they're from the lost tribes of Israel, they only intermarry within certain family clans. And they actually have seen their family trees that to go back to King Saul where they have sub-clans and mini-clans within clans and, and for sure. So that's uh, that's something that I would say uh, they have preserved. But um, a lot of the, from the Judean exile, a lot of have, things have been lost as well. As far as you, you know, you get sold to Rome uh, on ship as uh, uh, slaves, uh, you know, the, the fall of the first temple. So we know which families are the descendants of the Roman, of the Israelites that were sold to Roman slaves. Uh, we know who their last names are today, and they trace back. These are, you know, Wikipedia pages for them. Research has been done. 
family documents from 2,000 years ago has been found. So there is, there is an element to that as well uh, for those who are able to retain it. But that's fascinating that you live that way as well, uh, you know, on your side. Well, Basil, well, we have a caller. I don't know if he's still on the line named Benjamin. Are you there? Yes, I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. Okay, um, hello, uh, hello, Rabbi. I just, I just want to uh, comment about the Yoruba. Now, first and foremost, I heard you saying that uh, the Yoruba don't circumcise on the eighth day. Um, me, well, being a descendant of Yoruba, and how they do. Hmm. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, well, I understand, and, and, I'm, and I'm coming respectfully to you. I know there's a whole lot that you haven't heard, but so... What I'm about to give you, I'm about to give you some sources where you can start the study and make your own conclusions, all right? And I'm about to point out some facts about the Yoruba. Uh, what Rabbi Basil is saying, the uh, Akwete, is very true about the Ewe and, and all of them. But I'm going to specifically speak on the Yoruba because this is the culture I've been knowing the most, okay? One, um, you're going to want to get books by Modupe Oduyoye, all right? He speaks on the linguistics of the Yoruba, and when you find, look at these linguistics, you will find that there are a whole bunch of Hebrew words. As we know, mm -hmm. the most important thing to any man in his culture is his God. Tell me why is it that almost every single word for God in Yoruba has a direct Hebrew cognate? We can go to Oloran, Elram in Hebrew, uh, Eloa, Olua in Yoruba. Olam in Hebrew, Elemi. I mean, we, we can find all these words, several cognates. Even at that, if I am not mistaken, Sarah did call Abraham Baal, which means Lord, correct? Um, when you go into Yoruba society, you find that women call the head of the, com of the compound Baale. Be these are basically the same words, and they did not come transmitted through Islam because a lot of these words are predating them. When you start studying the Yoruba system and the Yoruba language, and when you really start paying attention to traditions, just as, let's say, with prostration, when a Yoruba uh, man uh, 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 bows to his elders, he gets all the way to the ground. You find the same thing being portrayed um, in Genesis, when they approach anybody that is of a higher caliber or that is higher than them or when they're seriously giving worship unto, uh, unto Yahweh, all right? So what I am pinpointing here is the fact that there are, there's a heap of evidence there, all right? We have circumcision. We have, um, we have all these words. In fact, there's a whole... It, it, it's so many words, I, it, nobody really detects it. It's so many if you really study it. And I'm not, you know, mad or anything. I understand that first you came and you said that, that this is stuff that you haven't heard of, that you haven't known. Um, and I understand. But first, I, I, I would just like to comment just as a, just as a, a, as a friend to, to, to another friend. I know that you must really want to research this, I would just suggest really sitting down and researching the cultures thoroughly. And I'm not sure, uh, but you got to be careful what the Evos say. And I'm not going against any... Well, ba well basically what, he, what he's, he's saying that, you know, you look at the Yoruba and you look at, especially you look at their divination uh, system, the Ifa system, the Ebo Afa system, even the Ifa system with the Ewe and Voodoo, uh, and uh, just like the, the ancient Umim and Thumim, the, 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 the Oracle, or what you had uh, the, the, the priest used to do back in the day uh, with the Kola Nuts and the divination trade. These are all basically things that are ancient in Hebrew traditions and customs. And he's right. You know, a lot of times you look at the, the priest, the priest of these areas and the ephahs and the aphas, you'll see that they are using languages that, that go back to ancient to ancient Hebrew. Uh, so, like I said before, in the, gen in the genetics, the Yorubas are basically the same as the Igbos. They're all genetically the same. They're all brothers. They all came from Jacob. They all came from Israel, migrated into Africa. Uh, so, there's, there's no difference between the Ga, between the Ewe, the Akon, the Oyo, the Yorubas, the Edobini, the Ibibio, the Igbos, and the, uh, the list just goes on and on. Uh, so, Basil, I'll let you just uh, – we got about eight to ten minutes left before we close out. So if you want to make some last comments. Yeah, so um, you mentioned about the, you, you, some people who are co-hands. Um, 
I guess you don't know about the Wulome in my tribe. The Wulomo is someone who sees the future. They are a high priest. And they, they keep to the Levitical commandments, laws that was given to Moshe. Like not going near a corpse. They, they actually have a holy of holies where they go to get words of prophecy. Um, they don't shave their beards. They wear all white. You cannot go near them if you're not circumcised. The Kohens that you mentioned about, do they keep these traditions and customs? Yeah, they definitely, the Kohens definitely don't go to um, graveyards, etc. And they don't, uh, I believe a Kohen is also not allowed to marry uh, someone who was once divorced. Uh, we, we, they keep those uh, as well. And um, if someone in our community today, let's say a Kohen married a woman who was divorced, then his children would have that status removed from them. And then we would remember for all the history that this Kohen lost. There's actually a family today whose last name means Kohen who lost their status of being Kohen because something happened. Okay. So uh, I'm saying this so that you can study that too because we have the same thing. We have the Wulome who follow to the detail, to the T, what is written in the Torah. And one of our Wulo men, he was called Numo Ogbame. He was the one who discovered after the um, European missionaries had come to the shores of West Africa. He was the one who discovered that the Torah or the, the, the book of Moses, the culture in it was similar to what we were doing even when the missionaries hadn't showed up yet. So it's something that uh, like I said, it's a culture to it, and we can see it right there in the Torah. Well, if you read my, um, also, yeah. I want you to read this custom called Fiashidi, F-I-A-S-H-I-D-I. This was the custom that Samuel the prophet had to go through when Hannah brought him to the Kohen, so that he becomes an intern. This same custom that Samuel went through, that started with Japheth's um, vow that he was going to give whatever that came to meet him when he came back from his his war, he was going to put that on the altar. This is a 4,000-year custom, and we do this custom today in West Africa, where when somebody cannot have a child, where their family issues, um, maybe untimely death that's going on in the family, one would go to the priest and make that same vow. And when they, they're given the fruit of the womb, they take this child and then go and dedicate this child to the temple. It's called the Bride of Yeveh. The Bride of Yeveh. This is a Torah custom that we still keep today in West Africa, what we call Eve Nibah. Okay, so I'm showing you all this because one has to sit and study these customs. See, when you want to know about a people, you come to the people so that they tell you about themselves. You cannot go to someone else. Let's say the Igbos or Remy shouldn't be your point of contact. Whatever he said, and I'm, not, I'm, I'm taking shots at him, but I would advise that you go past the Igbos. You go past the, the Remy's because they're not the authority on the ground. Talk to the people themselves, the people that I have mentioned. Research them, and it will shock you that you will find the ancient Torah customs right there on that strip of land that is called Ebe All right, uh, two things. One is it seems like there's you know, uh, a need to write a, write a book or make a documentary about this, I'd be the first one to buy the book or watch the documentary. Um, well, I'll send you the book. No, I, I, <laughs> we, already, we already have the books. I'll send you the book. Yeah, the, 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 and the Hebrew sure. niggas is going to drop bombs on people too. Then, then, the, the next step of after reading the book is then you make relationships with people on the ground and, the, you know, then you see the book comes to life. So it's, it, it, the book should be a living thing. And I think there's other places around the world today that you can give large speeches of where they're actually doing um, things with the Israelites. For example, if you look at J- Japan, the oldest monarchy in the world today claims to be from an ancient homeland that was exiled from their land and reestablished the kingdom in Japan. 
they have a holy temple in Japan today on Mount Moria. We know that was the name of the mountain of the Temple of Solomon. And they have three mm-hmm. chambers, an outer chamber where people celebrate, an inner chamber where they do animal sacrifices, just like the Temple of Solomon, and an inner chamber where they keep a golden ark and four poles today with three things in the ark, just like the time of Solomon and golden birds on the ark. And so all of a sudden, you know, and you look at the Japanese uh, alphabet, very similar to Hebrew, a lot of the words are similar and stuff. So, you know, when people ask me, they say, oh, does that mean the Japanese are Jews or not Jews? I said, well, that's the wrong question. Because first of all, we don't know if 10,000 Israelites crossed the Silk Road and made it to Japan and started a kingdom. Or maybe it was one Israelite that made it there and started a kingdom and a movement. Just like when Esther went to Babylon, she rose to power. When Joseph went to Egypt, he rose to power. This could have been the story of, uh, of a businessman who rose to power and created a great influence. But the, the, for me, it all comes back to the same thing. So it's not about the wrong question. It's not about if he's Jewish or not Jewish. That's the wrong question. I don't think the future of the world is going to be dependent on are people Jewish or not Jewish. Uh, I foresee a global family forming. I, I think there's a verse. So I have really poor memory, but I know there's a verse uh, in the prophecies where it says, this one's going to come out and call himself by the name of God. And this one's going to call himself uh, and say he's from the, the, the house of uh, the Lord. And there's going to be three or four different terms that people are going to refer to themselves in the future uh, as being part of this congregation of, the, of, the, of Israel. And I, I see that that's what's happening today. It's very clear to me um, that when you have such large nations of people from around the world saying this, that our, our agenda should not be to battle one another and try to figure out how we could politically uh, maneuver one to another, but to create a unity. And that being said, as uh, like I said, I don't necessarily agree with the, the political stance of Israel today as a state and how they relate to the diaspora and, uh, and categorize the, uh, who is a Jew and not a Jew. That's not necessarily uh, something I'm, I'm, I'm supporting or defending. And uh, we have to have a lot of teamwork going forward to get to the bottom of this. And, and, um, and I can't uh, say my people haven't been involved in contributing to evil, but I can't say other people as well who, who come from the people of Israel don't have people amongst them who have done evil. So right now it's not about the Jew or not Jew. It's about righteousness versus evil. And if there's, uh, we, shouldn't, we shouldn't be afraid to, to put uh, evil out and, and, and wave it in the air. And if anyone tries to defend evil, there won't be room for that. All right, well, we we got two minutes on Basil and Rap and Harry, so I'm going to close it out. Uh, we're definitely going to have a part two uh, to get these get these guys back, and we'll continue on about the Pashtun Jews, about the the, the, the the people in Japan, the Makochi, the art pro, 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 that prototype covenant that they were um, they, you know, basically carrying, and I can tie that into how uh, the Ashkenazis are not the real Jews in terms of the R1A1A, which is basically seen in Central Asia and uh, Eastern Europe. Uh, it's also seen the past in Jews as well, but we'll, we'll, we'll dive into that next time we have uh, Basil and Harry in the show. But next week, we're going to have three outstanding ladies. Uh, one is a book author. Her name is Only Love Alston. And then we have Ada. She's from the Damaleke tribe in Cameroon, and also Sister Helen from the Kisi tribe in Kenya. The topic is going to be Hebrew women speak on Hebrews in Africa. At the same time, uh, uh, Wednesday is November 1st, 2017, and at that show, at the end, we will be informing you of, of what the next show is going to be, uh, and we're going to talk to Rabbi Rosenberg and Rabbi Aquete to see their availabilities to get a part two to continue this discussion about the Hebrews in West Africa, and also I can expose some genetics in regards to uh, what, uh, what's names talking about the Pashtun and the, Ashkenaz, uh, the uh, Afghan Jews. So that being said, I want to say thank you to Basil Aquete, Rabbi Basil Aquete, and Rabbi Rosenberg for coming on the show. Um, we went over a lot of stuff today, heard a lot of callers, a lot of truth coming out, and we will be coming back again with more uh, discussion with these two uh, rabbis. And I want to thank you guys for listening to the Hebrew Negro Show, and uh, shalom. Good night. Shalom.